It's in this holy name that we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. jump right into where we're going to go this morning. We've called the series The Gospel According to Ruth, and a lot of us are thinking there's not a gospel of Ruth. Gospel just meaning good news, and uh, good news is laced through this uh, Old Testament book. If you have a Bible with you, Ruth is the eighth book uh, of the Old Testament. You can funnel your way there. We're going to land in chapter three. Um, let me give you a little bit of, of just where we've been, what's going on in this story. It's an incredible story. There's plot twists. There's all kind of different things. There's a lot of cultural stuff that's in here that requires a little bit of explanation, and we'll continue to do that this morning. Ruth and her husband, Elimelech, or Naomi and her husband, Elimelech, Jewish, uh, at that time, there was a drought in Israel, and so they, out of necessity, left Israel, and they headed east uh, across on the, to the other side of the Dead Sea to a land called Moab, where they had heard that there was food, and certainly there was. They had two children as well, uh, and they stayed there a while, uh, over 10 years. In that meantime, those two boys married women from the area of Moab, which was not good. Uh, but then additionally in that time, Naomi's husband Elimelech passed away. Uh, her two sons also passed away. And so then it's Naomi and the two daughters-in-law. And Naomi hears, hey, there's food back. The drought's over. There's food back in Israel. And so Naomi tells her two daughter-in-laws, I'm going back. And I would recommend that you stay where you are because you have a future here, let me go back. And one of the daughter-in-laws uh, said, that's a good idea, I am going to stay. But the other daughter-in-law, whose name is Ruth, decided that she would, the, the biblical word here is she, she clung to her mother-in-law and went back with her and said, hey, look, your people will become my people. Your land will be my land. Your future is going to be my future. And so they do that. That's the end of chapter. Chapter 1. Chapter 2, there's two things that really are missing then in this, these women's life, largely because of the culture that they were in. And I know for, it sounds a little odd for us to say it, but one, they didn't have food or a way to make a living. And two, they didn't have a, a, a future, a, a legacy, a, a family, etc. So chapter 2 solves the food problem at least for a year. Ruth, being younger, goes to glean in the fields. And that's a, a system that had been put into place so that impoverished people, poor people, could actually have food to eat. They would go to the fringes on the, on the fields where the, food was kind of, the, the, the grain was left alone. They could pick and harvest uh, the leftovers from a crime. That's what Ruth did. She goes to the field of a man named Boaz, uh, who... Uh, was kind to her. He noticed her. And if you're here last week, Caleb kind of brought the Hallmark themes into the story of Ruth. And uh, Ruth and Boaz, uh, maybe there's something that could work out. And so Boaz takes care of her and gives her an abundance of food. Now, we're going to get to chapter 3 today. And um, what we're going to find is that the story that's going to unfold for us gets a little dicey, right? It's like, what's going on here? Is there some stuff under the table that we're not really hearing about? You know, is this just a kind way to put it? If you're a Jew at this time, 
And you hear, you're an Old Testament Jew, you know, 2,500 years ago, and you hear the beginning of this story because Ruth is from Moab. You're thinking, oh, I know those people. Those people are scandalous. I want to read from you from Scripture how the people of Moab began. And if you're a Jew 2,500 years ago and you're hearing this story, you're thinking, this is the kind of people that Ruth is. All right, so don't turn here. Genesis chapter 19, I'm going to read 30 to 37. Lot, this is the story of Lot. Lot and his wife, they are in Sodom and Gomorrah, and Sodom and Gomorrah gets destroyed, and Lot and his wife and his two daughters flee, and they escape. All right, so Lot, Lot's wife turns into a pillar of salt. There's a whole another story with that. Lot went up from Zoar and stayed in the mountains and his two daughters with him. For he was afraid to stay in Zoar, and he stayed in a cave, he and his two daughters. Then the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old, and there's not a man on earth to come in to us after the manner of the earth. And you're thinking, is that saying what I think it's saying? It is. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and let us lie with him, that we may preserve our family through our father. What? So they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. He's too drunk. And it came about on the morrow that the firstborn said to the younger, Behold, I lay last night with my father. Let us make him drink wine tonight also. Then you go in and lie with him, that we may preserve our family through our father. So they made their father drink wine that night also, and the younger arose and lay with him, and he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. You've heard that before. Thus both the daughters of Lot were with child by their father, and the firstborn bore a son and called his name, and he guesses, Moab. And that's where the people of Moab came from. And so if you're a Jew 2,500 years ago and you hear about this woman named Ruth who's from Moab, you're thinking, ooh, I know what those people do, and I, know, I remember this story. And when you start to hear the beginning of Ruth chapter 3, you're thinking, oh, this is just going to be like that. This is not that. The story in Ruth chapter 3 is not that story. It's entirely different. And I want to just kind of unfold for you what goes on. So Ruth chapter 3, verse 1. We're going to walk through, through this again the way we've been doing this. Kind of verse my verse with some explanation. And what I want to do is I want to, I want to lay the, go- the gospel, the story of Ruth over the gospel of Jesus and the bright light of the gospel of Jesus and sh- see what shines through this story of Ruth. Uh, let me give you one point. I'm going to give you five things that we can pull from the, the, this part of the, 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 the first one really has to do with, here's what we can learn about the gospel of Jesus. In, in, in Ruth 1, verse 20 and 21, all right, this is when they're Naomi is bringing Ruth with her. They're coming back into to Bethlehem. And she, Naomi, said to them, the people of Bethlehem, don't, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Now listen, that's just words on a page, but there's a lot of pain in that. There's a lot of hurt in being broken, feeling empty, feeling just like, I got nothing. I got nothing. Um, a lot of you have heard national news um, in the, this past week that there were four senior girls at Pepperdine who passed away because of a car accident. They were pedestrians. They were just walking, got hit by a car, hit some other cars, and they were killed on the scene. I have a senior daughter at Pepperdine. That community is rocked by, I mean, it's just out of senseless. And here's what, here's what they feel. They feel broken. They feel empty. There's just this, ah. So I don't want to, I don't want to belittle and, and make a trite saying here, but here's what we can learn from this story of Ruth is that your emptiness is a part of the gospel over your life. Because God has this pattern of there's emptiness, there's brokenness, there's tragedy, there's impossibility, there's hopelessness, but God, God steps in and does things. And if you walked in here this morning with this circumstantial problems that are walking your way, God has a reason for you here this morning. So let's walk through this chapter three of Ruth to see if you can see the gospel of Jesus in this story. 
Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, Ruth's mother-in-law, she's been gleaning in the field. Right? Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, my daughter, shall I not seek security for you that it may be well for you? What is that? What is that? Seeking security for her. So Naomi's been taken care of, right? So has Ruth. You know, Ruth's been taken care of, and then through Ruth, Naomi's been taken care of. But that's for this season. Like a harvest, is, it, it's about over now. What's going to happen next year? And so Naomi looks at her daughter-in-law and says, Let, let's, let's get you a future. Or let me translate it this way. We're going to get you a man, right? Like, and the, the natural one to think about is who you're going to look at in the story about Boaz. Boaz is taking care of her. He's, he, she caught his eye. And so, she, so maybe Naomi's putting on the mother-in-law cap and saying, I'm going to hook you up, all right? So verse 2. And now is not Boaz our kinsman with whose maids you were? Behold, he winnows barley at the threshing floor tonight. And you're like, you can see the plot twist. Oh, she's putting this into action. She's, got a, she's been thinking about this. And it's this, you get this feeling that, that Naomi's been sitting back and watching. Ruth comes back every day. She's got this abundance and grace. Hey, did Boaz talk to you? Well, yeah, kind of. And, and you get the sense that Naomi's going, come on, man, make a move. And so she's going to put a plan into action here of, all right, let's see if we can, you know, press this a little bit. Caleb mentioned last week that in a lot of ways, you kind of get this feeling that this story is like Hallmark. That it's like this is a Hallmark movie. Well, this is Hallmark meets The Bachelor. <laughs> so the, the, is not Boaz our kinsman? Caleb introduced this concept last week. It's called the kinsman redeemer. Another way that God had built into the code of the Old Testament that, peop, that poor people or people that were destitute or had issues could get those fixed was what's called the kinsman redeemer. Meaning that the, if, if somebody was, you know, had to sell themselves, themselves into slavery, then the kinsman, the, kin, the closest kinsman had a responsibility to care for them to make things right. Sometimes it means you have to buy something back. Sometimes it means you're just going to, I'm going to defend, I'm going to stand for, but it's the kinsman redeemer. So here's the plan. Verse three and four. Wash yourself, therefore, Naomi speaking to Ruth, wash yourself, therefore, get that barley smell off of you, and anoint yourself and put on your best clothes. Now there's some symbolic stuff in that. When you anoint yourself, what, 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 Naomi is telling Ruth is, hey, look, I feel the pain you feel that you've lost a husband. I've lost one too. But wash yourselves, anoint yourself, and put on your best clothes and make it a known you're available. All right? So put on your best clothes and go down to the threshing floor and do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. Drinking. All right, so this whole winnowing and threshing floor, we're talking likely it's at the end of the harvest. Uh, and I got this big pile of barley, but it's, but it's unrefined barley. There's like the, the shell is still on it, the husk. So they did this thing of threshing, and they just did, to get all of the, the meat of the barley separated. So go down to the threshing floor where they're going to do all that work. Um, Go down to the threshing floor, but don't make yourself known to the man until he's finished eating and drinking. And it shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies and shall go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what you shall do. All right, so this, the, the wording for um, uncover his feet and lie down, there's some, there's some overtones to that, all right? There's some intimacy language in that. It's like, Okay, what, what, what are we doing? Which is why Naomi told Ruth, make sure to notice where he lies down. This isn't going to be a well-lit area. This is like the field, big pile of barley. He's going to be on one end of it. Just notice where he lies down because this uncovering and lying down at the feet, you don't do that. You better pick the right spot. Right? You know, don't pick the wrong guy because there's some overtones of what potentially could happen. Verse 5 and 6, and he, she said to her, so Ruth looks back to her mother-in-law, Naomi, and says to her, all that you say I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law had commanded her. 
That's so easy to read over. Uh, don't read over that too quick. Um, I, I, I'm like you. I have these thoughts of, hey, you know, what are some, yeah, I go to a funeral or I, or, or I, or I do a service, and, and I'm thinking, what are the things that I would want said about me when my last breath has been breathed? What are the types of things that, you know, you, what, what are the kind of sayings that you would want on, uh, on a tombstone? All that Jesus said, he did. Like that, that, all that you say I will do, that is the mantra, that's the verbiage, that's the speech of what discipleship looks like. It's what we try to do on every given Sunday morning. It's what life groups are all about. When you go to a Bible study here, youth, you go to 320 students, that's what we try to do. All that he said, we will do. So we're going to figure out what he says, and we're going to figure out how we can do it. There's, a, there's, there's more than a series in that. We could do a year's worth of messages on that theme right there. Don't read over that too quick. Verses 7 to 9, we get to see this play out. So all, this, is, this is her doing all that Naomi had told her to do. So verse 7, when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry. Okay? That doesn't mean he was drunk. He had eaten to his fill and he had drunken enough to be satisfied. All right? It's that feeling that you and I get. You know when you, when you, when you, you eat and you're like full and you're like, ah. And what happens when, you, when you're full? You get tired. Man, it's time to go to bed. So he's satisfied, he's eaten, he's full, his heart was merry. He went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. All right, so he's, he's out a little bit, and he's asleep by the, at this point. And she came secretly and uncovered his feet and lay down at his feet. And it happened in the middle of the night that the man was startled, and he bent forward, and behold, a woman was lying at his feet. Now, my, my version doesn't have an exclamation point there. I think... There's a woman lying at his feet, and he's, he's shocked. He's startled. He sits up, and he's like, what is at my feet? And he said, who are you? Now, it's dark. He's sleepy. He knows who, who Ruth is, right? He's seen her every day. He's got a little sparkle in his eye when he sees her. So he gives her all these blessings. He knows who Ruth is, but again, it's dark, and he's tired. So he, who are you? And she answered, I, I, I'm Ruth, your maid. Interesting point. She's not his maid. She's not. She worked with his maids. She's not his maid. What's she saying? I'm, I'm, I'm at your call. And then, like up to this point, she's done everything that Naomi, her mother-in-law, told her. But then she adds something, not wrongfully, but she, she does something in addition. And she says something. I'm your maid. And then she says... So spread your covering over your maid, for you're a close relative. That's not translated, I'm kind of cold, can I have some of the blanket? That's not what this is. If, if you jump back to chapter 2, verse 12, you don't have to go there, but, but this, is, this is when Ruth is in the field and she's gleaning and Boaz notices her and he asks and he finds out that she's a close relative and all that kind of stuff. And here's what in, in 2, verse 12 says this, Boaz's words to Ruth at that time, May the Lord reward your work and your wages be full from the Lord and the God of Israel under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. That's the same verbiage that Naomi then says here to Boaz when she says, would you lay your covering over me? In essence, what she's saying is, hey, you prayed that God would bless me and God would shelter me. I'm asking you to step in and do that. Right, the if you if you looked at at multiple people that have preached on Ruth chapter three, a number of of preachers title that message the proposal of Ruth, and that's exactly what this is. This is her proposing. Hey, I'm not. She's not. This is not this seductive thing. If if this is a seductive thing, she's not laying at his feet. She's laying at his side. But she's laying at his feet in this show of vulnerability to say, would you care for me? She's proposing. Our son Micah proposed last weekend, all right, eight days ago in Charleston, beautiful setting, sun's going down. We had the big she said yes party and everything. That's not what this is. God bless all of the males who have proposed or will propose in the last 20 years, all right? The pressure, right, it's got to be an Instagrammable moment. This is not very Instagrammable. And it breaks all kind of traditions. 
Like she's going against cultural norms. This is norms. This is a woman proposing to a man. This is a Moabite woman, you know those people, proposing to a Jewish man. And this is a Moabite Jewish young woman proposing to what we find out and what we know to an older man. This isn't just Hallmark meets The Bachelor. This is Hallmark meets The Golden Bachelor. <laughs> All right? So she's proposed. We get to verse 10. Then he said, in the dark, he's still wiping the sleep out of his eyes, may you be blessed of the Lord, my daughter. You've shown your last kindness to be better than the first by not going after young men, whether poor or rich. And, and what's the, wait a minute, the last kindness is better than the first. So the first kindness that we see from Ruth was the kindness that she showed to her mother-in-law, Naomi, when she said, no, I'll follow you. I'll go, your people will become my people, your faith will be my faith, your land will be my man, land, your future will be my future. I'll, I'll be by your side. And that's incredibly kind. And Boaz says, but this one is more than that. Because you have, you've looked at me past my prime. And you've said, you proposed, right? And then we get verse 11. Now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you whatever you ask. He said yes, right? The big banner, right? Not she said yes, he said yes. For all, like that, so that, 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 I can't, I don't know what, I don't know what Ruth's heart did when he says that. All that you do, all that I will do for you, whatever you ask. For, in, for all my people, this is a shocking statement. For all my people in the city know that you are a, what, a woman of excellence. You're a Moabite woman. This is, I mean, for the people of the city of Bethlehem to look at this Moabite woman coming, oh, that's those people, and to look at her and know that she's a woman of excellence says an amazing amount of stuff about, about Ruth and how she lived her life. She was a woman of excellence. Um, David Platt, and a lot of you know his name. He's, a, he's an author. He's a pastor. He made this point, and I agree with him. So in the, in the Hebrew Old Testament, Okay, not, not our Old Testament, okay? I mean, our, our Old Testament is translated from Hebrew. But the, the Old Testament, the way they put their books together, the order of their books is different than the way we put our books. Not entirely different, but there's differences. And the book of, of Ruth in our Bible follows the book of Judges. But in the Hebrew Old Testament, the book of Ruth follows the book of Proverbs which means it follows the last chapter of the book of Proverbs, which is Proverbs chapter 31, which addresses, anybody know what Proverbs 31 is about? A woman of excellence. All right, Proverbs 31 verse 10 says this, an excellent wife, that's a, it's the same word as the woman of excellence, an excellent wife who can find for her worth is far above Jewels. And David's Platt point, David Platt's point was that, you know, perhaps the reason why Ruth was put after Proverbs 31 is that Ruth is the picture of what an excellent wife looks like. She's hardworking, she's diligent, she's a woman of integrity, she cares for her family. She's an excellent woman. So he said yes. It's like, okay, this, if this is a Hallmark movie, the snow's about to come down. It's amazing. The music's starting to build. It's so romantic. It's almost like he's the first kiss going to happen, whatever. And then you get the snag, right? Every Hallmark movie has the snag. You know, it's the old boyfriend or it's the old girlfriend or the person that they, they just fell in love and then she got a job offer someplace else and blah, blah, blah. We get the snag. We find the snag in verse 12 and 13. All right. Now, uh, Boaz just said, yes, I'll do for you what you want. You're, a, you're an amazing woman. Verse 12, and now it's true that I am a close relative. However, uh-oh, there's a relative closer than I. There's a kinsman redeemer whose rights go before mine. Remain this night, and when morning comes, if he'll redeem you, good, let him. But if he does not wish to redeem you, if it's going to cost him too much, if he's not interested, then I'll redeem you as the Lord lives. 
lie down until morning. I, I, I've liked Boaz. I love Boaz now. Like his character is just amazing. Here's a couple of reasons why. One, because he didn't take advantage of her. Right, well, Mark, I mean, maybe he did take advantage of her. I mean, they're at the end of the barley heap, and it's dark, and nobody knows. And if he took advantage about it, we'd know what he would know about it. We'd know about it. You know why? Because Scripture would tell us. Remember Genesis 19? <laughs> right, you remember David and Bathsheba? You remember, you know, Amnon and Tamar? And, you know, there's a thousand stories out of the Old Testament that are just like scandalous. Scripture's not so sanitized that we've got to take all the dirty stories out. If if Boaz would have taken advantage of, of Ruth, we'd know about it. But I also think that Boaz's character stands out because perhaps the reason why Boaz has not been making moves all barley season, why he's been slow to act, why Naomi's gotten frustrated, it's like, come on, man, ask her. Perhaps why Boaz has been holding back is because he knew that there was a relative closer than him, and in respect to the Old Testament law and custom, he's like, it's not my place. And then I, I love Boaz, too, because of the last thing that he says there. Lie, lie down till morning. Translation, I got this. Don't worry about this. Take, I'll, I'll take care of this. Just, just lie down, be at ease, and this is on me. So verse 14 and 15. So she lay at his feet until morning and rose before one could recognize another. It's dark. And he said, hey, let's let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. Keep this under wraps. Why? Because it's scandalous and because they did something dirty? No, because other people would look at it and go, it's scandalous and you did something dirty, even though it hadn't. Again, he said, give me the cloak that is on you and hold it. So she held it and he measured six measures of barley and laid it on her. Then she went into the city. What's a, what's a measure? We don't know what a measure is. We don't, know what that is. we don't know what the unit of measurement is. He just had six of whatever that unit is. It wasn't a cup. How do I know that it wasn't something small? Because he put it on the cloak, and then he laid it on her, right? I see when she walked into the, into the city, she, wasn't, she didn't have a little Gucci bag, right? She's like this big bundle of whatever. And then we get to, to and it's, there's so much care in this. Like Boaz isn't just taken care of, he's abundantly taken care of. Verse 16 and 17. And when she came to her mother-in-law, can you, all right? So Naomi's been up all night. Did Naomi get any sleep that night? I don't know. Because she's thinking, all right, my plan, my plan. Here it is, here it is, here it is. It's either going to go south or it's going to be really, really good. When she came to her mother-in-law, she said, how'd it go, my daughter? Tell, tell me, tell me, tell me, spill, spill the stuff. And she told her about the, all that the man had done for her. And she said, Ruth telling Naomi, her mother-in-law, this includes something that we don't know until now. She said, these six measures of barley he gave to me, for he said, Boaz told me, don't go to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Hey, look, Boaz was going to care for Ruth. I mean, that's a given. He's going to care for Ruth, season in, season out. But this isn't for Ruth. That big haul that, that Ruth brought back was not for Ruth. That was for the mother-in-law, future mother-in-law, was for Naomi. Love Boaz. Then verse 18. Then she said, Naomi speaking to Ruth, wait, my daughter, until you know that the, how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest until he has settled it today. There's an urgency to this redemption thing. Today's the day. Hey, he's going to take care of it, and he's not going to dilly-dally. He's not going to put it off. He's going to take care of this today, and there's an urgency that I think probably we'd be wise to take hold of. L let me quickly give you four more things as we lay the story of Ruth over the gospel of Jesus. This good news of Ruth, here are some things that shine through. that reveal to us things about who God is and, and the way God acts. If I, if I said to you, hey, the God character in the story of Ruth is... That's an improper statement because God is not Boaz in this story. God is not Ruth in this story. God is, God is so multifaceted in this story. He's in a lot of this story, and we see some of the things about him and the way that he works. The first that I would share with you is this, is that God's kindness defies description. 
That word kindness is laced through this story, all right? So in chapter 1, verse 10, you don't have to go there, but it's talking about the, the kindness of God and what, you know, the, the, and how God deals with people. Uh, chapter uh, 2, verse 20 talks about the kindness of Boaz to both Ruth and Naomi as he's in the field and he's caring for them. That's his, his kindness. And then the kindness in chapter 3, verse 10, is Ruth's kindness to Boaz. Your, your second kindness is, is better than your first. All right, so the word kindness um, in Hebrew is hesed. And um, we don't really have a great English translation for that. Kindness is, is very one-faceted. But in, in the Hebrew, it's like all these different layers. Sometimes it means benevolence. Hey, I just want what's best for you, and I'm going to care for you, and I'm going to give you something. Sometimes it's forbearance or patience. Hey, look, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna to hold out. Sometimes it's sacrifice. Sometimes it's forgiveness. I mean, there's all loyalty, the, God's kindness. Like, there's not a word that we have to, to accurately describe God's kindness. So we walk through things, and we go, how in the world does God allow things that an accident on the side of a road on the Pacific Coast Highway in Malibu to take the lives of four senior girls? I wouldn't let that happen. And, I, and it makes me feel like what my kindness is more than God's. God's kindness dis, defies description. And we can't understand all of the things. Like, who loves people more than, like, I love people more than God does? God's kindness defies description. And if you're walking through the worst week of your life, God's kindness defies description. And he can work through anything. Here's another thing that shines through with the gospel according to Ruth is that the gospel is far-reaching. It's interesting if you go back and you look at the, at the story of Ruth and you read that regularly, even towards the end even, Ruth is described as Ruth the Moabitess. And it's a reminder to us that Ruth wasn't just from some woman. Ruth was one of those women. And yet God's, the gospel reached to and through this woman as well. And if you walked in here this morning and you thought, man, this is the last place that I deserve to be, or this is the last place I want to be, and there's no way God could reach out with his kindness towards me, you are flatly wrong. The gospel is, is far, far reaching. Yeah, but Mark, you don't know. I don't have to know. Yeah, but if God knew, he does. And God's kindness is far, far, far reaching. Number four, don't underestimate the power of small steps. All right, so Ruth and Boaz and, and, and even Naomi, they do these small steps. And I mean, part of these, I mean, they're not, they're not huge. I mean, they're, they're, they're not teeny tiny. But I mean, these are some of the big things that they do. But they're kind of small steps, all right? And so a little spoiler alert. I'll come back next week anyway, but Ruth and Boaz end up getting together. He marries her. They have children. All right. But we find out in the last two verses, and I asked permission for Caleb, from Caleb if I could do, share the end of this with you because he's going to teach next week. Ruth chapter 4, verse 21 and 22. This is the closing words to the book of Ruth. It's the genealogy. Here's what happened. To Salmon was born Boaz. To Boaz, Obed. To Obed was born Jesse. And to Jesse, ba, 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 David. All right. All right. Dave, this is King David. That, look, Boaz, small little step of kindness, but because of small step, Boaz and, and Ruth indirectly is included in the genealogy that gets to King David. Here's what I love, is that when you get to the Gospels, Matthew includes the genealogy that, go, genealogy that goes forward from there. Check out Matthew chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. There's two women that are mentioned here. To Salmon, these are the same steps, but the women are included, but just two of them. To Salmon was born Boaz by, oh my goodness, Rahab. Y'all remember the story of Rahab? You know what she did for a living? She got paid for that. All right? I'm convinced that one of the reasons why Boaz had a heart for people's heart and didn't judge people from where they came from is because of his mama. And he saw that, 
Yeah, that's what she was, but her steps of faithfulness in hiding the Hebrew spies and this daring risk that she did, and then she married a man, and that was her, she became his, his mother. And to Boaz was born Obed by one of those women. How did Ruth and Rahab land themselves in the genealogy of my Savior? Small steps. They just did the small step of just, I'm going to be kind. I'm going to take the risk. I'm going to, you know, as, as you know, that, that verse 5 and 6 of Ruth chapter 3, all that she said, all that he says, I'm going to do. And some of the things that God asks you to do in small little steps, and you're thinking, just, I, I can't, I can't. I, you can. You can. And small steps puts us in position where God does amazing things. And lastly, is that our cost for redemption is similar yet unequaled. All right, so listen, uh, um, redemption basically uh, literally means buy back. Um, and if you came in here this morning and there's this sense that you're broken, that you feel empty, it might be circumstances or it might be something a lot deeper than circumstances. It's like, I just, life just has nothing to it. I, my prayer is not that you hear the gospel of Ruth this morning, this cool story of this woman who gets bought back. My prayer is that you recognize that the story of Ruth's redemption is nothing compared to the story of your redemption. And the cost that Boaz will have to pay for Ruth's redemption is similar, but it's not even close to the cost that Jesus paid for my redemption and for your redemption. Jesus made an interesting statement. John chapter, you don't have to turn here. John chapter 15, verse 13. This is Jesus' last night. This is before the, the night before the crucifixion. He looks at his loved ones, and he said, greater love has no one than this than one lay down his life for his friends, and he's about to live that out. It's interesting because um, in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, Paul dives deeper than that. Um, I think Jesus is right. All right. Greater love is knowing than this than you die for a friend. There is a greater love than that. It's when you die for somebody that's not your friend. Romans 5 8, God demonstrates his own love for us in this that while we were not friends, enemies, apathetic, could care less. I don't want anything to do with God. He bothers me. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that is a way higher price. And what Jesus paid is a lot more than what Boaz did for people just like you and I. Now, the gospel shines through this story of Ruth well. But perhaps maybe this morning, as a person, you want to recognize, God, I want to thank you that you, you did, Jesus, you did die for me. And I gave my life to you X number of years ago. Whatever. I'm walking this, I just want to pause this morning to say thank you for redeeming me. But maybe this morning you're like, yeah, I came in here this morning. I wanted nothing to do with God. But I recognize that Jesus paid something for me. A hideous, painful death. And if God would do that for me and demonstrate his love like that, love like that, I will follow after him and pray for us. Lord Jesus, thank you. Um, the gospel of Jesus is so much richer than the gospel of Ruth, as rich as it is. And there's good news to Ruth. Thank you for the integrity in the heart of this man, Boaz. Thank you for the vulnerability and the risk of this woman, Ruth. Thank you that what you can teach us through them. But Jesus, thank you that my redemption...